get started right now. And I wanted to, we want to say a couple words though first about both Herb Krauss and Eugene Winkler, both of whom passed away this last year and were integral parts of our work actually. Um, Herb, who many of you knew or would have recognized, was um, sort of the behind the scenes person for decades with the ceremony outdoors. He did all of the PR until Nina Barrett and Tracy Bain took over, but he really, he did that for decades and decades. Herb was a public relations person who um, represented a number of different clients, including Martin Luther King Jr., um, the Harold, the Harry Truman Library, and then things like Inland Steel, Marina City, and 31 Flavors, Baskin and Robbins. So a broad, <laughs> A broad range, um, and he he passed away in um, in May after a, a long illness. Um, he many of you know he he was a person. I think Jim may say a few words at the end of the program. He was a person who always came in with a derby hat, was wearing a derby hat, and at the end of the program, put out the derby hat for contributions to our program because we are all self-funded. So I think Jim will have that derby hat again at the end of today's program but we really wanted to recognize Herb, and he worked hard to keep the memory of Clarence Darrow alive. So he's, he's, a, he's a big loss. He hadn't been here for several years already. Um, Gene Winkler is somebody who spoke usually at the outside part of the bridge of, of our ceremony. Um, he was a United Methodist preacher for over 50 years, and even though Darrow was an agnostic, we always called him Darrow's preacher because he so embodied the work that Darrow cared about so um, completely. He was a founder of the Protestants for Common Good and served on a number of boards, including the Illinois ACLU and Garrett Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. He was a ceaseless advocate, both in terms of his sermons and his advocacy for civil rights and inclusion of all people. He was passionately involved in struggles against racism, war, and poverty. Um, he was arrested on numerous occasions for nonviolent civil disobedience actions in protest of the Iraq War, police violence, and racial discrimination. So you can see really where he fits into the Darrow themes. Uh, his sermons involved, and he did in terms of even what he said outdoors, poetry, stories, and laughter. Um, and he preached faith, forgiveness, love, mercy, kindness, and justice. And I think for both of them, not only are we going to miss them in these ceremonies, but really in the society that we're living in today and the challenges that we're facing. But thank you for this time. And I'm going to turn it over to, Stace, to Tracy to begin to introduce our program. So that, that was Anita Weinberg. Um, uh, we have Nina Barrett over here. Nina Helstein, where are you? It was the outdoor moderator. And myself, we're on the Clarence Darrow Committee. My name's Tracy Bame. And I do this in memory of my mother, Clarence, uh, my mother, Clarence Darrow, my mother, Joy Darrow. Um, and we also have another Darrow relative here. Did you make it, can you, can you introduce yourself? Judy Besser, I'm his great granddaughter and I can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> this is my son, Douglas, and his wife, Dawn, and my daughter, Diane, and my friend, Mary. Excellent, we are honored to have you here today again. Thank you all for making the, the trip into the museum. We're going to make some announcements later that will make your trip easier next year to the program. <laughs> um, our first attorney, what we decided, this is the 80th anniversary of Darrow's death, so we decided to um, look for um, three attorneys that were inspired either throughout their career or more recently by the work of Clarence Darrow. So we're going to hear from each of those folks, um, about eight, eight or so minutes from each of those folks, and then we're going to do a program on the fair housing with Marisa Navarro and our actor in the house, Keith Butler, reading um, Darrow's own words. So our first um, of the three attorneys is Nabila Rashid. She's a Pakistani, British, American, Muslim, queer lawyer. Happy to call her my friend. <laughs> biochemist, biochemist, activist, born in Britain and trained as a biochemist. Dr. Rashid moved to the U.S. and became a lawyer practicing in Chicago. Recently, she left private practice to become section head of intellectual property at Abbey V. She serves on the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. Welcome. Oh, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Tracy. I am. It is actually one of the greatest privileges in my life to call Tracy a friend. If there is anyone in Chicago that um, embodies that embodies the spirit 
of uh, Clarence Darrow, it is Tracy. Um, we really do, we, we really do look up to her in all of the communities that I come from. Um, and as Tracy said, and I'm going to start my timer because I'm a great one for keeping an eye on my clock. Um, as Tracy said, uh, I am a Pakistani. I'm Muslim. Uh, I'm queer. I'm a lawyer. But before I became a lawyer, I moved to the United States um, to teach uh, science, to teach biochemistry. And so actually, long before I went into law school, I had heard about uh, um, Darrow, and I had heard about um, the monkey trials. And um, growing up, as I say, I did my PhD in biochemistry in Liverpool in England, and we've already been talking about um, British sports over there at the table that I'm sitting at. But um, when we were studying, uh, you know, sort of like back in my heyday, the idea that anyone would, would find evolution objectionable or well, let's not say objectionable, but anyone that would find it a problem to teach it in school <coughs> was, an, was an anathema to us. It was something that we couldn't possibly have thought that in this day and age that you, were, that, that you would find that to be a, a, a prevalent viewpoint. And um, I think very early on, certainly my biology mistress um, was also um, a queer woman who had who was one of the first people to get a PhD uh, in biochemistry from the University of Oxford, and so she was very um, she was very political, and she was very aware of um, how how our politics had had gotten uh, influence from the United States, how we had influenced the United States. And she was one of the first people to tell me about this little known movie in the, in, in the UK called Inherit the Wind. And so I pretty much, I, I've known, I had known about Darrow from the age of about 16 onwards and all throughout my life. And so then when I came to the US, um, and again, it was to teach science. When I came to the US and found that, um, that actually there were a lot of places in the South that still were objecting to, to evolution in the curriculum, it, 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 was, it was quite strange. Um, and so I, I did read a lot about him back then, and and then even more recently, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my girlfriend was standing up here doing um, uh, doing one of one of the closing speeches, um, and we did we did find ourselves going back and looking over the life of this incredible man, and I think that when I started law school, I realized that. Um, you know, you know, there is one thing to be pursuing a career and pursuing uh, the almighty dollar, as it were. And then there's another thing to follow one's heart and to follow a principled life. And I think that, um, that Darrow showed this very well in the way that he, in, in the arc of his life. Um, he started out um, long before, long before you know, sort of like he became famous in in, in the trials that we're going to be talking about today. He was very much a corporate lawyer, and he was very much um, following, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a very commercial path. And I think he could have done very, very well. He was certainly by the time 1925 came along, and certainly by the time that uh, the monkey trial came along, he he was as well known as any lawyer or as, as, as any service provider in the country. And I think that he, he did present a moral compass on one side of the spectrum. And I think that that's what was interesting about this trial, was that by the time he got to this trial, he had given up the idea of, of being this great commercial lawyer and had moved to a space where his voice and his intellect could do the greater good and could serve the greater good. Um, at least one third, throughout his life, at least one third of his cases, he dedicated and he, gave, he, he did pro bono, he did and he worked for indigent people without charging a fee. I mean, and that, even back then, and you're talking about 1925, you're talking on the, on the cusp of the Depression. 
And this man is, is following a deeply rooted principle in, in, in the way that he was in the way that he was conducting his life and in the way that he was in, in, in the way that he was fighting for a cause. Now regardless, as I said, as I said at the beginning, I'm I'm a Muslim. I don't find the teaching of evolution to be antithetical to my faith. But, you know, I can see that there would be people that would. And I think that that's what's interesting about this particular trial is that you see a moral arc. And an, an arc has two ends. At one end, you had Dr Darrow, and at the other end, you had Brian. And, and really, naturally, most of us fall in the middle somewhere. And most of us have to figure out for ourselves how and where we fit along that arc and how and where our morals allow us to, to walk through life. Um, for me, I, I, as I say, despite being a fairly religious person, mine lie on the side of Darrow. I mean, I, I, really, I really cannot find myself uh, in any kind of position where, where I would keep a theory, an education, uh, uh, you know, a principle away from our children. And I think that that's, I think that drove him. I think that drove him a great deal. It wasn't just his agnosticism that drove him. It was a principled idea of how we should live a life and how we should teach, how, how we should teach our next generation. And I think that that principle today and this week is more important than ever. We can't, regardless of where we are along the political spectrum, we cannot be a nation who decides to withhold education from our children. That is the way to a third world, a third world society and a third world education. And if we are to remain in the first world, we have to follow the principles of individuals like Darrow. And there are many others, but this is a guy who really did push forward with an idea that that we have to present we have to present ourselves as, as the best of ourselves to the next generation, and I think that that's what he did. And so, you know, I haven't really talked a great deal about my law career, but really, if, if one looks at how someone like Darrow has, has affected me throughout my life, it really has been to find and identify the principles by which you want to live and the principles that which you want to transmit across to others. Whether they want to walk with you in those principles or not, it is your moral responsibility to put those principles forward. And, and that's why I've always respected and admired him as much as I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabila. Um, yes, Nabila's partner, uh, Fazia Mirza, was our performer a couple of years ago doing Darrow. Um, it was fantastic. Um, so next we have Scott Shadis, uh, Council and HIV Pro Project Director at Lambda Legal, where he litigates impact cases involving HIV discrimination, HIV criminalization, and access to care. Shadis has also co-authored amicus briefs for the U.S. Supreme Court, assisted in dismantling the HIV travel and immigration ban, works on legislative reform, and was a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS until resigning last June. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you, Tracy. It is uh, an honor to be here. Um, I was really excited to be, to be asked uh, to come and be a part of this event. And I'm going to jump right in because I have a lot to say. Um, so first of all, as Tracy said, I'm the HIV Project Director at Lambda Legal. I, I work exclusively on behalf of people living with HIV. I'm a person who lives openly with HIV myself. And, um, and that informs, I think, a lot of my advocacy and work in this area. Um, my introduction to, uh, to Clarence Darrow and who he was and his work is probably as a number of people in my generation was through the reading of Inherit the Wind in high school. Um, I think that happens pretty frequently in the United States, maybe more in the North than in the South. But, um, but indeed, that was, that was my introduction to Clarence Darrow. Uh, and I had then an extra dose because uh, I was a performer and an actor before I decided to move into the law. Spent about a decade working in the, in the theater and I actually performed in a production of Inherit the Wind. Uh, where I played one of the uh, 
this was in repertory. I played one of the uh, jurors, so I didn't really have much of a part, but I got to watch the play unfold uh, multiple times, and so came to appreciate um, the man more through that. And so I really view, I think, uh, Clarence Darrow through uh, his participation in the Scopes Monkey Trial. And uh, what I'm here to talk about today is what I think uh, that trial in particular uh, displayed about the man, which was this desire to, to elevate science and reason, um, or to, to choose science and reason over superstition and belief and fear and bigotry, really. And so that has informed uh, my career and my work. Uh, I would say that all of the work that I actually do on behalf of people living with HIV, or almost all of the work, all of the, the cases in which I've been involved, come down to that issue of taking the science around HIV and what we know about HIV today and how it is and is not transmitted and what the risks really are, and opposing oftentimes the very ingrained beliefs that people have um, that we actually spent uh, decades um, through our prevention work around HIV, putting these fears into people's minds about how HIV is and is not transmitted, um, that we now find ourselves working on the backside of to try to make people understand that, for instance, there is no risk of having a food service worker who is living with HIV. That does not present a risk to anyone, but you bump up against these very ingrained fears and beliefs that people have about how easy it is to transmit HIV, which it's not. Um, and, um, and so that's what a lot of my work has to do with. I want to quote um, a, a study that actually was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2012, so not that long ago. It's now getting, I guess, a little, starting to feel a little dated, but I would, I would guess that these figures have not moved very much. One third of all people in the United States uh, that, they had, that they surveyed in this study held one of the following beliefs, that you could get HIV from sharing a drinking glass, that you could get HIV from touching a toilet seat, or that you could get HIV from swimming in a pool with someone living with HIV. One third of all people believed one of those things. So that's what I'm talking about when I say sort of an ingrained belief that people have that then you have to come and show them the science and make them understand um, how HIV is and is not actually transmitted. And while it's fairly easy to sort of uh, look down our noses at folks who held one of those beliefs, um, the fact is, is that the science has taught us much more. And, um, and there is actually, I say, um, not a job in the United States that a person living with HIV cannot safely do today. And so we have to keep pushing those boundaries. As the science progresses, as the science moves forward, we have to keep pushing on those boundaries. So that includes healthcare workers living with HIV and first responders living with HIV. And that's really where my work today is focused, is on that cutting edge of this issue, of bringing the science um, to those ingrained perceptions. Um, we spent a long time, as I said, really engaged in those sort of fear-based messages. and. And the result of that has been that that was on the backs of then people living with HIV. Because we are now suffering as a group, um, and I live in a privileged space, so I'm not uh, you know, really referring too much to myself. I get to live openly with HIV, and it's pretty safe. But that's a pretty rare thing in this world today. Approximately 20% of gay and bisexual men in living in an urban environment are living with HIV. And yet, I think you could probably count on one hand the number of people that you know who are openly living with HIV. So it's still a highly stigmatized condition. And we helped to create that, right? By the prevention messaging that we did over years and years, we helped to create that fear. And that is nowhere is that more uh, sort of stark than in what we call the HIV criminalization laws. So folks may or may not be aware, but there are laws on the books in Illinois, uh, in a number of states, and I'll talk about a case in Iowa in a minute, um, that make it a felony for a person living with HIV to have uh, a sexual contact with someone and be and not disclose their status or, and this is important, not be able to prove that they disclosed their status to another individual. And in Iowa, in the case that we worked on there, um, this was on behalf of a, a, a gentleman um, by the name of Nick Rhodes, and he had a one-time sexual encounter with someone he met online. 
Um, they did not uh, talk about HIV status before uh, having this sexual encounter. Um, they engaged in activities that really did not present uh, any real risk of HIV transmission. Folks may or may not be aware, and this is a, another place where like the science keeps moving forward. So a person living with HIV who is on effective treatment, as I am, is incapable of transmitting HIV to another person. Um, that has now been uh, declared by the CDC, which is a pretty conservative public health organization. So um, there's another example of, well, the science moves forward, and, but people have these old ideas about how HIV is and is not transmitted, and they still play out in our law. So this gentleman had an undetectable viral load. It was impossible for him to transmit HIV. He was engaged in activities that were very unlikely to transmit HIV, regardless of his viral load. And yet, uh, after this encounter, he was prosecuted by this gentleman. Um, there was no transmission of HIV. Uh, he pled guilty and was sentenced to 25 years in an Iowa prison for being HIV positive and daring to have uh, an active sex life. Um, we uh, took that case, and we ended up taking that case all the way to the Iowa Supreme Court. And really, I mean, I think that the arguments there are very much in line with what Darrow would have endorsed. We got that court to review what it had said previously about HIV, what it had said previously about this law. It had, I think, rather erroneously and, and foolishly taken judicial notice in previous cases of how HIV was and was not transmitted. It had already decided that it could be transmitted through oral sex. Art had already decided that it could be transmitted without ejaculation. And, um, and neither of those things are true, but the court had taken those views. So we really had to work hard. Um, and I would think and I would hope that Darrow would be proud of the work that we did convincing those justices to go back, look at what they had said previously, and really reverse themselves um, to, to be willing to consider a different viewpoint. And I think it was in part very good lawyering, and I get to say this in part because I did not argue it before the Iowa Supreme Court, my colleague did, but he did a brilliant job of getting these folks to look at a, a topic they probably didn't want to have to think about too closely, which was sex between two men and HIV, and get them to change their minds. And so that is what I think um, Darrow is about. I'm gonna close with um, something that's happening today in our government that is frightening to me. And that is that we are, uh, we are not elevating science and reason um, above uh, belief and superstition um, and people's bigoted views. Uh, recently, the CDC sent out a missive to its employees telling them that they didn't want them to use seven words uh, in the upcoming budget uh, discussions with, with Congress. Uh, and those seven words were vulnerable, entitlement, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, or science-based. They were not supposed to use those words. When we have a scientific organization, a scientific entity within the government that is not supposed to use science-based and evidence-based, we have a problem. And really what that was about, that was code for, they wanted them to say that we, uh, what was the phrase, that, they, that the CDC uh, bases its recommendations on science in consideration with community standards and wishes, which was about privileging religious views over the, what the science actually told us. And we see this across a range of things, right? We see it in the work of the CDC on abstinence-only sex education. It has been proven that it doesn't work. It has been proven to be ineffective. And yet, that is what is on the rise again within the government. Um, we see it in how the resources are going to be committed to communities that are affected by HIV. And we see it in, in other issues across with climate change, et cetera, et cetera, this privileging of of people's views over science. Um, that is why I resigned from the Presidential Advisory Council this past year, because I realized that I was dealing with an administration that wasn't going to be very interested in the science, and that I would be better off being on the outside, like I think Clarence Darrow was most of his life, critiquing what was happening um, at the top levels. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.
every year we do this and Darrow becomes more relevant every year. Um, everything old is new again, especially this uh, last year and a half. Um, our final of the attorneys speaking um, is Catherine O'Daniel, a criminal defense and appellate lawyer based in Chicago. She has tried numerous criminal cases to verdict in state and federal courts across the U.S. In 2015, O'Daniel was awarded the NAACP Thurgood, Thurgood, sorry, Thurgood Mar Marshall Award for her work in achieving an acquittal before a jury in the case of a man charged with first-degree murder who waited six years in the Cook County Jail for his day in court. Welcome, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome, Tracy. I'm honored to be here on the 80th anniversary of Clarence Darrow's death. I'm a sole practitioner here in Chicago, and I specialize in criminal defense, as Tracy said, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I've been doing it for 25 years. It's gone by in the blink of an eye. My practice has taken me all over the United States, and I've tried criminal cases to verdict in courtrooms across America, in giant cities, and in teeny tiny towns, in rural country courthouses. Uh, and there's just nothing like the power of a jury. And it has been a hell of a ride. It's been a hell of an education. And I've been privileged to make a lot of friends along the way. Um, and tried great cases and amassed fantastic war stories. So I'm, I'm sure Clarence Darrow could relate to that, having the good war stories. Um, and I think that at least the commercial side of Mr. Darrow would have appreciated my motto in my earlier career, you buy, I'll fly. So I saw a lot of the country that way. Um, but I think he would more have appreciated my passion and my, my zeal when it comes to underdogs and, and representing underrepresented. Um, and a good dog fight, gloves off type of fight in front of a jury. I think that that was probably what excited him most in his career and I can certainly relate to that. Um, but I think in, t in today's real courtrooms, um, he would probably hate the reality of the law as it is today, at least when it comes to certain nonviolent offenses like, a, like drug cases. And I'm going to tell you that story. My brush with Darrow relates to a drug case. Um, and the very act of deciding to go to trial in certain drug cases can quite literally cause a client to spend the rest of his or her life in prison. And I'll get to how that, how that works in just a minute. We're all sitting here in Chicago, in Illinois, and I bet if we took a poll, uh, everybody in this room would feel, or most people would feel like they're in a blue state. I assure you that if you want to be disabused of that notion like this, just travel south of I-80 and step foot in any courtroom, federal, county, no matter where, south of I-80, we're very much a red state. Which brings me to my story, and it's about a girl named Leticia Garcia, and it's about my brush with Darrow, and it'll this family over here is probably going to, to know who I'm about to talk about. The year is 2007. The defendant is Leticia Garcia. The crime is seven kilos of heroin. Now that was not now. Seven kilos of heroin now, I, I'm surprised there's not a death penalty for it. But back in 2007, the crime is, is seven kilos of heroin deeply hidden in a secret compartment in the dashboard of an SUV, which was in the name of Leticia Garcia. The county is Henry County, the state is Illinois, and the venue is the United States District Court for the Central District of Illinois, set in Rock Island. And the prosecutor is none other than Sarah Darrow, who is related by marriage, and I believe she would be the, and maybe you guys can help me with the family tree, the great, great granddaughter. And she's married to Clarence Darrow, maybe the third, who practices law in Rock Island, Illinois. So. Not only are the, the facts tough, um, and I'll get to the evidence. Oh, the evidence. It's best described as an orgy of evidence. Dash cam video captures a speeder, captures pulling the car over, captures the defendant, the shaking like a leaf train wreck of a 21-year-old Leticia Garcia. It captures the canine being led around her car. It captures the canine going wild hitting on that car. It captures her giving consent to search. It captures the actual search of the car. And it ends with capturing her full confession. So, uh, like I said, orgy of evidence, and I entered the scene. And as if the evidence weren't bad enough, 
I look up and my prosecutor's last name is Darrow. I have <laughs> DNA against me too. So I started, when I sat down with those videos, I started with a, some popcorn to watch the movies. I ended with an empty bottle of wine. <laughs> but the worst fact, and, and let me just point out that the uh, seven kilos of heroin, the price tag with that is 10 year mandatory minimum in the, in the uh, United States Bureau of Prisons. The worst fact, as if all those weren't enough, uh, was Letitia's background. Letitia is, and you have to understand a little bit about her, she grew up dirt poor in Texas. She was a teen mom. Um, she had two kids by the time she was 20. Not educated um, and not, had some work history. Um, but what I learned as I got to know her well, and I, by the way, know that Mr. Darrow got to know his clients well too, and that's something you're taught in law school. Don't cross that line, don't get personal. If I were ever to teach law school, I would say cross that line, get personal. How can you feel it? How can you present it to a jury unless you do that? Um, anyway, Letitia had a heart of gold and with her still waters ran deep. And just because she wasn't educated didn't mean she wasn't really smart um, and, and a good person. She committed a crime, but that didn't make her not a good person. Um, Letitia is someone who knew what it was like to suffer and she knew that before those flashing red lights on that fateful night in October of 2007. Um, she, on that night, before that night, she had two felony convictions. And what did they come from? They came from drugs, personal use amount of marijuana, which was just north of the line of demarcation. It was personal use, 31 grams, made her a convicted felon in Texas. Why? Because she and her family didn't have the funds to hire somebody that would file a motion to suppress, that would fight it super hard, and she just pled. Um, and then another was a stop sign. She ran a stop sign, she got pulled over. That led to a sweeping full search of her car and her purse. And one prescription pill in a baggie in her purse, which she'd forgotten she had, was pain medication for someone else. Um, she catches her second convicted, or for her second felony conviction. So that becomes very, uh, very important to the story and I'll keep my story moving because I know that we're on a tight time frame. Um, anyway, Letitia's kind of desperate, has two kids to take care of, and somebody offers her 5,000 bucks to drive that car, drive that car to Chicago. She almost made it, and it was the most expensive $5,000 she never made. But that $5,000 in her, in her mind, game changer for her and her two kids. Um, but not as big of a game changer as her background would come to be in, in context of the, of the story. Um, Mr. Darrow may have had a chance on that case because there weren't any videos, there weren't any drug sniffing canines back then, and there certainly wasn't 21 United States Code Section 851. Um, that is a provision in our code, and the title of that is Proceedings to Establish Prior Convictions. It's a Nixon era. It was the opening salvo in the war on drugs. I know what we'll do. We will double people's mandatory minimums. We will just, we will just imprison people for the rest of their lives. And nowadays, in, in modern parlance, you're one click away because they can file those pieces of paper from their computer, prosecutors can, and you're one click away from a life sentence. And that's what happened to Letitia. Um, and the funny thing is those are called sentencing enhancements. I looked up the word enhance, it means improve the quality of. So it's sort of a, a bad joke uh, for lawyers and a worse joke for, for drug defendants. Um, and the government filed those notices in, in Letitia's case, and she quickly, like I said, in the blink of a mouse, click of a mouse, natural life. She was looking at natural life, and I'm looking at this evidence, and you know, so I channel the inner Darrow. Well, Darrow, what would Clarence Darrow do? As much as he loved a dog fight and a great jury trial, the idea of even announcing that you're going to trial gets the the government to file those notices. So there we were, and it was not a pretty position to be in, and so. I was in a quandary and, you know, how do I tell someone, plead to natural life, why don't we just fight? Um, and I thought to myself, Mr. Darrow would stand in the way of Sarah Darrow. He would find a way to stand in the way of that machine and protect the underdog and he would find a way to save her life. So I dug in deep, I went on a mitigation mission, I pulled little papers that had gold stars from kindergarten that she'd earned that her mom had saved. I did a, a thorough job of collecting letters, of collecting photographs, of collecting medical records, of, I, I even got 
birth certificates to prove that her children are United States citizens and that she, a Mexican, was actually is an American, born here in the United States. I put together a big packet and I went to Sarah Darrow and I think I used tools that I know were around back in Mr. Darrow's days, but maybe he didn't have to use as I did in this, in this case. Persistence, annoyance, and good old fashioned begging. <laughs> I lit up Sarah's phone every chance I got and finally and I remember I remember and I will remember till the day I die where I was when I got the phone call that she had convinced and with these 851 enhancements once they're filed they're not going to get unfiled they're not going to get dismissed unless you catch the miracle that we caught so after months of begging and pleading um, Sarah Darrow called me and said we give we're going to take one of them back. So that left her. She was a ten. She was charged with a ten-year crime. She got bumped up to life and bumped back down to 20, 20 years. But she had and she couldn't win the case. So it was 20 or life. Um, and on on the 20, we figured it out that we had it worked out where she would serve about 15 and a half. Um, and so she cried tears of joy. I'm telling her it's going to be 15 years, and you got to waive your appeal and trial and everything else. Here's a woman who was weeping with joy. And I think I probably told Sarah Darrow that I loved her that day. <laughs> Letitia pleads. She goes off to prison. Her goal is to get home in time to see her baby daughters that she's leaving behind, maybe go to prom, maybe graduate from high school. We never lost touch, and my parents, this, they play a loop in my head all the time. And one of their sayings is money. It's not everything, but it sure keeps the kids in touch. <laughs> and so it was with Letitia who would write, we became pen pals and friends, and she would say, you know, my kids need this, and I would send off money here and there. And I always made sure Letitia had money on the books. And Mr. Darrow now would be quite surprised to know that now inmates can text you from the Bureau of Prisons. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, at least, at least uh, they've given them better means to keep in touch. Anyway, story doesn't end there. Fast forward to 2008, and um, there's another famous Chicago lawyer, I'm sure you've probably heard of him, Barack Obama. He comes into office and he comes with Eric Holder, who people have different opinions of him. He's one of my personal heroes because he ushered in a, a, a he's top prosecutor and here's the guy that's ushering in a much needed criminal justice reform nationwide. And he started with the, the failed war on drugs um, and that stupid 851 enhancement, which still remains, but they set about taking, uh, reducing these, these mandatory minimums by um, reducing the sentences for these drug crimes. So the guidelines changed, the sentences lowered, and Letitia takes a giant step toward her long journey home um, with these sentencing reductions that were enacted. Then in 2006, story's not over, but it's getting close. Um, <laughs> kind of like Tracy is. In, in 2016, on his way out the door, that famous Chicago lawyer, Barack Obama, granted executive clemency and knocked the last six and a half years off the nonviolent offender, Leticia Garcia's sentence. And so I say, I repeat Clarence Darrow's words, justice has nothing to do with what goes on in a courtroom. Justice is what comes out of a courtroom. Leticia and I became unlikely friends when she became a casualty in the war on drugs. And I'm happy to be just a link in that chain of Chicago lawyers um, who've never met and who never will meet, and the least of whom stands before you today to tell this story. Um, but I'm honored that we all collectively made a mark on a girl from Texas in a courtroom in the Midwest. And that chain continues today, and, and it's all the shared values that Mr. Darrow stood for um, and stood for in his life. And we all try to carry out uh, every day. My brush with Darrow can be summed up this way. Never say die, never give up, and never, ever, ever quit. And thank you for letting me give the talk today. That was fantastic. When she told me some of that story on the phone, I just couldn't even believe it. So I'm really glad some Darrow folks are here to hear that story firsthand. We need to do some investigation of that part of the Darrow family and do some, do some work. Um, and now we have Nina Barrett's going to introduce the, the second half of the program. A 
Okay, so I am Nina Barrett. I'm the junior member of um, the committee. You probably all know me as the flower girl because to get on the Clarence Darrow committee, you have to spend 10 years coming and handing the flowers out <laughs> before they let you say anything. Um, but actually, it's been nine, I think it's been nine years. Um, I was invited to join the committee because in 2009, I curated an exhibit on the Leopold and Loeb case at Northwestern University, and that's what you know got the committee in touch with me. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, all of you probably know, um, that was a case in which um, the murderers, who were two brilliant University of Chicago students, confessed. And the only thing the parents thought could possibly save them from the, the, the gallows was the attorney for the damned, Clarence Darrow. So um, we've been eagerly awaiting um, a book that I wrote based on this exhibit, which um, has now taken the last nine years, but it's coming out in July. And um, yes, you all have a postcard on your table. It's called The Leopold and Loeb Files, an intimate look at one of America's most infamous crimes. Um, and I want you to be on the lookout for it for in when it comes out in July. Um, I also happen to own a wonderful independent bookstore in Evanston, Illinois, called Book Ends and Beginnings, so you can drop by and buy it from us. Or you can just wait till next year because the committee has invited me to be next year's speaker. So we'll be, we'll be talking about Leopold and Loeb and Darrow next year. Um, a word about next year. So we are, the, the committee is considering um, a change in the format for next year. Uh, the bridge ceremony will continue as usual. We will never take, we'll never do anything different with the bridge ceremony because that's where Darrow's gonna wait for us to come to him. Um, but there is a chance that we are going to move this part, the symposium part, to the Newberry Library and make it a, an early evening event, like 6 o'clock. Um, and it may not be on even on the same day. Our thinking is to open up the symposium to people who can't get here on a weekday morning and, you know, locating it more centrally. Um, so that is not a done deal. We're not sure about it yet. I'm just raising it as a possibility, and it's a good reason to make sure that you have signed the sign-up sheets so that we can reach you and let you know what's going to happen next year. You can always check with our Facebook page, too, but please make sure you sign those uh, sign-up sheets if you haven't. And um, also, I just want to mention we are, again, next year sponsoring the um, Clarence Darrow Award in the Metro School uh, History Fair. And um, we, a couple years ago, we had the winners come um, and present, and we love doing that. So, so we're hoping that will be part of the program also next year. Okay, so now we're gonna pivot for the second part of the program. Um, in addition to commemorating Darrow 80 years after his death by hearing from these three attorneys who were inspired by his work, we are also focusing on housing segregation in recognition of Darrow's work against housing discrimination and racial bias and the 50th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act. So we're going to begin with a reading from Darrow's 1926 sweet case in which he argued that 11 African American men were being tried for first degree murder because of the color of their skin after they defended the home of one of the men who had moved into a white neighborhood in Detroit, Michigan. And then we're going to look at today and where we are on this issue that Clarence Darrow defended, which is the right for everybody to live wherever they choose. Uh, a little background on the Sweet case. Ossian Sweet was a physician in Detroit in 1925 when he purchased a home in a white neighborhood. And then when a mob tried to force him out, he and his family and his friends defended the home. Well, one of the attacking mob was killed in the violence, and Sweet and his family and friends were charged with murder. After an initial mistrial involving all 11 defendants, the state planned to try each defendant separately. But when the trial of the first individual defendant, who was Sweet's younger brother, Henry, resulted in a not guilty verdict from an all-white jury, the state did not pursue the other cases. So today we have with us Kevin, uh, Keith Butler, who is going to um, 
recite some excerpts from Darrow's seven hour closing. So it's gonna be a little abridged, we think. Um, Keith starred as Kevin in the Made for TV. <laughs> I know, in, well, in Leopold and Loeb it was three days, so. <laughs> he was not a short-winded man. Um, Keith starred as Kevin in the Made for TV movie three-part series, Kevin's Room, about a counselor putting together a support group for black gay men. He has made appearances in other TV shows, including How I Met Your Mother, and movies including Dreamgirls. And we want you to listen as he reads these excerpts because so much of what Darrow was arguing could, could just totally be said today. And then following Keith's reading, Marisa Navarro, who many of you met at the bridge, director of the Metropolitan Planning Council's Housing and Community Development work is going to discuss the current effectiveness in Chicago of the 1968 Fair Housing Act and the findings of the council's recent report on a multi-year cost of segregation project. So right now, let's please welcome Keith Butler. So I wasn't nervous at first, and then I found out that the family was here as well. I was like, okay, now I'm nervous. <laughs> so as most actors like to do, they like to set the scene. And so I'm just going to visually let you know who I'm looking at and who I'm talking to. So of course, you are the jury. And we're going to say that the judge is over here and the defendants are back here. If it pleases the court, gentlemen of the jury, I insist that there is nothing but prejudice in this case. That if it was reversed and 11 white men had shot and killed a black while protecting their home and their lives against a mob of blacks, nobody would have dreamed of having them indicted. I know what I'm talking about and so do you they would have given them medals instead. 10 colored men and one woman are in this indictment, tried by 12 jurors, gentlemen. Every one of you are white, aren't you? At least you all think so. <laughs> we haven't one colored man on this jury. We couldn't get one. One was called and he was disqualified. You 12 white men are trying a colored man on race prejudice. I think not one man of this jury wants to be prejudiced. It is forced into us almost from youth until somehow or other we feel we are superior to those people who have black faces. Who are we anyway? A child is born into this world without any knowledge of any sort. He has a brain which is a piece of putty. He inherits nothing in the way of knowledge or of ideas. If he is white, he knows nothing about color. He has no antipathy to the black. The black and the white both will live together and play together. But as soon as the baby is born, we, begin telling him what he must do and what he must not do. We tell him about race and social equality and the thousands of things that men talk about until he grows up. It has been trained into us and you gentlemen bring that feeling into this jury box. All I hope for gentlemen of the jury, is this, that you are strong enough and honest enough and decent enough to lay it aside in this case and decide it as you ought to. My friend Maul said that my client here was a coward. Who are the cowards in this case? Cowards, gentlemen, 11 people with black skin, 11 people, gentlemen, whose ancestors did not come to America because they wanted to, but were brought here in slave ships to toll for nothing for the whites, 
whose lives have been taken in nearly every state in the Union. They have been victims of riots all over the land of the free. They have had to take what is left after everybody else has grabbed what he wanted. The only place where he has been put in front is on the battlefield. And when we are fighting, we give him a chance to die, the best chance. But everywhere else, he has been food for the flames and the ropes and the knives and the guns and the hate of the white. Regardless of the law and liberty and the common sentiments of justice, that should move men. Were they cowards? These blacks have been called many names along down through the ages. But there have been those through the sad years who believed in justice and mercy and clarity and love and kindliness and there have been those who believe that a black man should have some rights even in a country where he was brought in chains. There are those even crazy enough to hope and to dream that sometime he will come from under this cloud and take his place amongst the people of the world. If he does, it will be through his courage and his culture. It will be by his intelligence and his scholarship and his effort. And I say, gentlemen of the jury, no honest, right-feeling man, whether on a jury or anywhere else, would place anything in his way in this great struggle behind him and before him. Perhaps I weary you. Perhaps these things that seem important to me are not un, are unimportant to you. But they are all a part of the great human tragedy that stands before us. And if I could do something, which I can't, to make the world better, I would try to have it more tolerant, more kindly, more understanding. Could I do that and nothing else, I would be glad. Gentlemen, I feel deeply on this subject. I cannot help it. Let us take a little glance at the history of the Negro race. It only needs a minute. <laughs> it seems to me that the story would melt hearts of stone. I was born in America. I could have left it if I had wanted to go away. Some other men reading about this land of the free that we brag about on the 4th of July came voluntarily to America. These men, the defendants, are here because they could not help it. Their ancestors were captured in the jungles and on the plains of Africa, captured as you capture wild beasts, torn from their homes and their kindred, loaded into slave ships, packed like sardines in a box, half of them dying on the ocean passage, some jumping into the sea of their frenzy when they had a chance to choose death in place of slavery. They were captured and brought here. They could not help it. They were brought and sold as slaves to work without pay because they were black. They were subjected to all of this for generations until finally they were given their liberty so far as the law goes. And that is only a little way because after all, every human being's life in this world is inevitably mixed with every other life. And no matter what laws we pass, no matter what precautions we take, unless the people we meet are kindly and decent and human and liberty-loving, then there is no liberty. Freedom comes from human beings rather than from laws and institutions. Now, that is their history. These people are the children of slavery. 
if the race that we belong to owes anything to any human being, to any power in this universe, it owes it to these black men. Above all other men, they owe an obligation and a duty to these black men which can never be repaid. I never see one of them that I do not feel I ought to pay a part of the debt of my race. And if you gentlemen feel as you should feel in this case, your emotions will be like mine. Your verdict means something in this case. It means something more than the fate of this boy. It's not often that a case is submitted to 12 men where the decision may mean a milestone in the progress of the human race, but this case does. Now, gentlemen, just one more word, and I'm through with this case. I do not believe in the law of hate. I may not be true to my ideals always, but I believe in the law of love. And I believe you can do nothing with hatred. I would like to see a time when man loves his fellow man and forgets the color and his creed. We would never be civilized until that time comes. I know the Negro race has a long road to go. I believe the life of the Negro race has been a life of tragedy, of injustice, of oppression. The law has made him equal, but man has not. And after all, the last analysis is, what has man done? And not what has the law done. I know there is a long road ahead of him before he can take the place which I believe he should take. I know that before him there is suffering, sorrow, tribulation, and death among the blacks and perhaps the whites. I'm sorry. I would do what I could to avert it. I would advise patience. I would advise tolerance. I would advise understanding. I would advise all those things which are necessary for men to live together. So gentlemen of the jury, I ask you, on behalf of this defendant, on behalf of these helpless ones who turn to you, and more than that, on behalf of this great state and this great city which must face this problem and face it fairly, I ask you in the name of progress and of the human race to return a verdict of not guilty in this case. Thank you. My name is Marisa Novara. I am a vice president at the Metropolitan Planning Council. And MPC has been around the Chicago region for over 80 years. We were started in 1934. We're a planning and policy change organization. And several years ago, um, I started a project called the Cost of Segregation. And I started that work because um, I really wanted to be able to have a different kind of conversation in this region about what it costs us to live so separately from each other by race and income. And I felt like we weren't able to have a real conversation uh, in answering that question until we had um, different information than we had at that time. So I want to return to that in a little bit. And first, I want to just spend a little time on the Fair Housing Act. And, and the group that organized this, I think, really um, has done a great job of drawing together the anniversary of Mr. Darrow's death with the anniversary early next month of the Fair Housing Act and, and the importance of those issues together, which we just heard so eloquently argued. Um, 
in Mr. Sweet's case. And so I just want to spend a little time on the history. It's so uh, important and relevant um, to where we are today. So I'm just going to spend a moment. Um, many of you know this history, lived through this history, but we'll just call it a refresher. Uh, so the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, and many at that time were pushing for it to include a fair housing component. There was not enough support at the time for that, and so it languished over the next four years until the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, most of you know that he had spent some time uh, prior to his death in the North. He lived in Chicago at 1550 South Hamlin, so here's my connection to that. Um, for many years, me and my family lived in North Lawndale, um, which is where that address um, uh, resides. And I was uh, worked in affordable housing development. And the last project that I did um, when I worked for a community-based developer in North Lawndale was to redevelop the site of 1550 South Hamlin, where Dr. King lived in Chicago. And it's now a beautiful, uh, beautifully developed uh, set of affordable housing uh, units there in that, uh, on that corner at Hamlin and 16th Street, where Dr. King came to Chicago to fight for open housing. And he was not successful, I think we should note. He had uh, much better success in the South, uh, where he ran up against uh, people in government that were much more clear about the racial nature of their animus. Um, and here in the North, people were much more polite. So I'll come back to that theme in, in just a moment. Um, so in part, in recognition for Dr. King's work on open housing, and in part to try to quell some of the civil unrest that took place after, um, after his assassination, including right at the block, mainly along 16th Street and Roosevelt Road in North Lawndale here in Chicago, right around where Dr. King lived, were incredible riots, um, after which um, the destruction of that property and the refusal of the insurance industry to reinsure that property um, is still a mark in, in that community today. The Fair Housing Act then, uh, one week after his assassination, was finally passed as a corollary to uh, the original Civil Rights Act. And I want to just read you a quote from Senator Edward Brooke, um, who was a co-sponsor of this act as an amendment to the Civil Rights Act. He said two things. One that American cities and suburbs suffer from galloping segregation, a malady so widespread and so deeply embedded in the national psyche that many Americans, Negroes as well as whites, have come to regard it as a natural condition. Second thing, the prime carrier of galloping segregation has been the federal government. First, it built the ghettos, then it locked the gates. Now it appears to be fumbling for the key. Nearly everything the government touches turns to segregation, and the government touches nearly everything. So this is what one of the co-sponsors of the act said in 1968. Uh, the act was passed. It pro prohibits discrimination on the sale, rental, and financing of dwellings based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It was amended later in 1988 to also uh, include prohibiting discrimination based on disability or familial status. Here's the other thing it introduced. It introduced a term called affirmatively furthering fair housing. And if that term gives you the strong urge to take a nap, just stick with me. It's actually really, really interesting. Um, what it said was that municipalities and housing authorities that get federal money to, to provide housing cannot use that money to create housing that segregates people. It said that you not only had a duty to just not discriminate, you had to actually affirmatively promote integration. It's two really different things, right? It's, it's one thing to sort of work with the landscape you set up, which by 1968 was already quite far along in its entrenchment. It's another to say, going forward, you must actively undo uh, the kinds of uh, racial and economic segregation that we've set up. Uh, so that sounds great, but uh, the language was vague. What it meant to affirmatively further fair housing was not defined. And 
uh, essentially nothing happened. Uh, one of the early HUD secretaries, George Romney, father of um, presidential candidate Mitt Romney, was actually really um, progressive on this. And he actually tried to set out a path to say, if, if you, as a municipality or a public housing authority, ignore this rule, we're going to withhold HUD dollars from you. And that so infuriated uh, people at local levels that then President Nixon uh, showed him the door. And essentially nothing happened for the remaining 40 plus years. Until 2015, Julian Castro was the um, 16th HUD director. So it took 15 directors and 40 plus years to revisit the notion that government should not perpetuate segregation. It's kind of hard to believe. Um, but in summer of 2015, Secretary Castro came to Chicago and um, announced that he finally, uh, much delayed, was putting in motion enforcement of the notion the government should not create or perpetuate segregation. And that set off a series of rules under the Obama administration that, that began to say we're actually serious about enforcing this and we actually have expectations about how um, people should respond, how government should respond um, to affirmatively uh, promote integration. Unfortunately, we now have a HUD secretary who's called that social engineering. Uh, he's determined that after 50 years we need more time to determine how to actively further fair housing and uh, he's changing the HUD mission statement to remove anti-discrimination language and stress self-sufficiency instead. So in reality, I would say we know that what happened to Mr. Sweet in Detroit uh, still happens today. It just happens more politely. And I, I had a, a fair amount of thoughts on this this summer. Um, after we, we saw marches for white supremacy in Charlottesville, I wrote an op-ed that, um, that ran in the Chicago Tribune. And the, the headline was, Dear White People, We Don't Need a Torch to Be Part of the Problem. And my point was that um, we, I, I think most white people, um, in response to that display we saw in Charlottesville, um, you know, re, we recoil in horror. We say that's a horrible thing. How could people do that? Um, and then we will march out the door and protest affordable housing that's around the corner from us or any number of other things that we find ways to do that are socially acceptable. Um, and so, uh, my argument there and my argument today is that um, we will do polite things that subjugate people of color and, um, and we say with that our intent is good rather than acknowledging the impact of our actions. And so I think we see that happen um, in many ways today. Um, we see that in predatory lending. We see that in landlords who say, um, you know, I'm not actually approved for Section 8. Even though that's not how that works, you get approved. You don't have to be pre-approved. You know, there's, there's lots of ways to do this. And we know that when laws change, discrimination changes form. And so um, many of the things uh, that were in place at the time of um, Mr. Sweet's trial are not in place today. And that is a good thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't change laws. But I think we need to be um, honest with ourselves that and stay vigilant about the ways that discrimination will morph when we change laws um, and just to be cognizant of that difference, right? So quickly, uh, last year we released the uh, first, res first set of results for our study on the cost of segregation. And what we did was to, was to ask um, what would it mean for the Chicago region, so this is not just the city, but the, the region as a whole, um, if we were to um, if we were to be less economically and racially segregated. So we looked at the 100 largest metros around the country, and we looked at what happened to those metros when racial and economic segregation went up or down. What we found, and we did that over a 20-year period from 1990 to 2010, what we found was that in 2010, if the region of Chicago were at the median of those 100 metros, we would see another um, four billion in African-American income in the region, which translates to around eight billion in our regional GDP. We would see 30% less homicides in our region and another 83,000 bachelor's degrees. Since we've 
um, come out with that research, we've now been in the phase of, of kind of answering a second question, which is, so what do we do about this? What, how do we create a region that is more inclusive and that is more equitable? And we um, have lots of thoughts about that and have worked with lots of um, advisors and working groups and so on over the past two years to try to have some a, a comprehensive answer to that question. We, we will uh, be public with that later this spring. I think the main thing um, that I want to convey in, in connection to Clarence Darrow, in connection to Mr. Sweet's trial and the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act is for all of us to be vigilant and aware of the amount of work um, that is ongoing and remains to be done in the face of discrimination that will change form as we change laws um, and that we need to adjust accordingly um, and, and be ever focused on how do we move toward a more just and equitable region uh, that we all want to see and that we know that Clarence Darrow in the really eloquent, I'm so glad I went after you because even though it's hard to follow you, um, is so important to hear how that, how that argument was really framed even so long ago, um, that that's how we frame, are framing this is around justice and, um, and around understanding our history, but understanding that the history is very much alive and well today. It just looks different, it feels different. Um, but it's embedded everywhere. Um, so thank you all for, for allowing me to just give that window as well. And please um, make sure that we know how to reach you for next year. Uh, uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all again, and the year goes really fast. Thank you. Thank you.